Hi, how's it going? This is not really a tutorial, more of just a, a demonstration. However, my code for this will be linked in the uh, video description, as well as some references which I found useful. I've been starting to do a bit of research into bounding volume hierarchies as acceleration structures for ray tracing. The basic idea is we have our scene and we split the scene into um, spaces recursively. And those spaces describe the objects within the scene. What I'm gonna do is I've, um, I'm gonna implement a number of different techniques and use them to render a scene. I'm starting with the scene, which has, uh, let's say, a resolution of 640 by 480 pixels on, pixels on the screen, as well as I'm taking 32 samples per pixel for anti-aliasing, and I'm going to uh, bounce 32 times at most. This is basic, the, the basic ray tracing in one weekend um, demo scene w without all of the features. And I'm going to apply various acceleration structures to that and dial up the number of spheres, measure the number of milliseconds that it takes to render a frame. The basic uh, concept of building a bounding volume hierarchy tree is to start with a space, enclose the space, and then recursively split the space up in some way. We'll store a root node and then a bunch of child nodes, which can either be external or internal. An external node contains primitives, which we can trace against, and an internal node has children, which themselves contain primitives. And a, an external node does not just have to have one primitive, it could have a number of primitives. This is important because we still need to check collisions against boxes, and so it might be more cost-effective I found it was most cost effective to store at most 16 spheres within one box. That was the sort of the optimal level. So here's the basic um, build algorithm. So we start with a um, root node, which contains all the scene primitives. We have a stack and this stops us from having a sort of stack overflow with recursive function calls. So we push the root onto the stack and then we keep working while we've got something we pop the first node, then we check if, in this case, we check if the number of spheres in the node is less than the required criteria. In that case, we mark the node as external. Otherwise, we look through all the spheres which the node has. We create children, child nodes, we subdivide the space, and then we um, check for every sphere, which child it belongs to, and it could belong to multiple children, and sort of populate the, the children, then pop the child onto the stack, push the child onto the stack. And to traverse the sphere, uh, the tree, we put on the root, and then we keep going, grab the first thing, check if we hit it, and if it's not a leaf, so if it's, if it's an uh, internal node, then we push its children onto the stack. And if it's an external node, then we test sort of ray trace against each of its primitives. So to get a baseline, let's have a look at the stats for just no acceleration structures at all. Okay, so just pure implementation with no optimization, it gets bad. It gets downright nasty, actually. This last case with 9,192 spheres took over an hour to render. And yes, I did sit there and watch it. It wasn't fun. So let's see if we can optimize.
Okay, so the first acceleration structure I'm going to try is a sort of a top-down uh, bounding volume hierarchy. Imagine we have some space, and this is 3D, so it extends up and down as well. And we sort of divide that space into a rectangle. And we find the center of the rectangle, and then we get the four quadrants around the rectangle. Those are the new uh, spaces that we're splitting into. But it's not even quadrants, it's octants, because we're going to also split the space above and below the center of mass of that imaginary grid. So we just keep recursively splitting things down. So with a basic top-down volume, bounding volume hierarchy, we have a major win. Th this last render has gone down to about 10 or 11 minutes from one hour. Um, however, we can see that for a small, a really small number of spheres, it's, it's pointlessly expensive because traversing the tree um, has some expenses. By the way, this collision was based on um, a reference, which I'll provide. But the basic idea, if we look at it top down, is that we have a box. And imagine the box sort of extends into a grid. And we have a array, which is, which is hitting that grid. So what we would do is we would solve the intersection equation for each of the for each of the dimensions individually so for instance we'll call this x naught is the minimum x bound minimum x value there'll be some minimum t at which we hit and there'll also be some oh sorry this is x naught isn't it it's okay so there's a minimum to hit in the X component and a minimum to hit in the Y component. And provided that those minimums keep increasing, that's good. But uh, let's look at array which doesn't hit. Oops. So imagine this array goes backwards. We have Again, reference is linked in the description. We have a minimum T value for which we would hit the bounds of the box and a maximum T value. And this maximum T value for the Y is bigger than the minimum T value for the X. So if any of the, if any of the maximum T values exceed the minimum T values for any of the dimensions, then it's bust. The, the ray doesn't intersect the box. And this is actually quite, quite quick to check but something which I neglected is we have sort of three cases as well when we do hit a box here let's say we're looking this way um, T minimum will be positive because the box is in front of us T maximum will also be positive because the end of the box is in front of us here we are inside the box we go out, so this is T maximum is positive. T minimum is actually behind us, so that's negative. And here's the case where we're looking and the box is actually behind us. So we do intersect it with our ray because we can you know, imagine looking behind us, but both T minimum and T maximum are negative. So it turns out if we trace against a box axis aligned bounding box and T maximum is negative, then the box is completely behind us and we can ignore it. And this actually lets us sort of speed up our render time.
so again further we have some more performance wins um, roughly the same performance until a certain point where the um, with the back face testing we get significantly faster and then it's sort of just yeah keeping along Okay, so there's one more technique we can use to uh, optimize this. And just for convenience, I'm going to look at the sort of the, the top down vision. Let's say we have our root over here is this grid and we have a single sphere here. So what we do is we divide the grid, subdivide the grid, then send the sphere to each of the regions. There we have it, we've sent it there. Now imagine that we are, yeah, let me, let me do this. Imagine we're here and we're looking, we're tracing, trying to hit that sphere. Okay, so um, we have to check against each of the children. We have to check against each of the children of the root. But I mean, it's kind of clear during construction that these three children do not have any primitives in them. So what we could do is while we're constructing the, um, the bounding volume hierarchy, if we attempt to throw our spheres into children, and then after doing that, we see that our children have no spheres in them, then we can disregard, delete those children. And this is sort of a, this is a sparse memory um, representation because instead of the root having all four children and then each of those roots having all four children, they've been pruned. So, you know, the root might have two children. This root might have three children. This root will have one child. And that makes the tree uh, a little bit faster to traverse. So again, here we have it. With a sparse data representation, we have some performance gain over the backface culling. Not dramatic, but it still is there. So um, that's good. And we're not really hacking things too much. We're just being a little more careful about how we store our data. So there we have it. This has been a comparison of various acceleration structures. Okay, so just as a bit of bonus content, um, here's the final result. In this stage, we're running the completely naive, unoptimized ray tracer. Now it's set up so that it's always gonna display something but the level of quality um, indicates how well it's performing. And now here we are with the optimized ray tracer. This is the sparse bounding volume hierarchy. And yeah, maybe it's a little harder to tell, but the resolution is higher. And more importantly, all we need to do is sort of look somewhere and the resolution improves. So as you can see, it's going faster and slower based on sort of where we're looking. So just set it up so we're just looking at a few spheres and we see the frame rate sort of jumps up. But then if we look at our scene, not so good and look i'm not saying this is a <laughs> oh, no <laughs> i'm not saying this is a perfect system but it is the the conceptual idea of acceleration structures so 
the next point in my research will be sort of taking this and working out how to rewrite the algorithm so that they will run on the GPU and get a significant speed up on this. All right, anyway, kind of looks like Christmas lights, doesn't it? Hope you had fun. Hope you enjoyed this little presentation and yeah, I'll see you again soon. All right, bye.